All right, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. We are here to discuss the reporting challenges around COVID-19. My name is Nell Conway. I'm with First Draft at their New York headquarters. I'm here joined today with Dr. Claire Wardle, who is the US Director of First Draft, um, and Ms. Anne Doe, who is a veteran Metro reporter for the Los Angeles Times and also the longtime leader with an Asian American Journalist Association. Thank you all for being with us here today. Uh, we have a couple housekeeping items before we get started. We will be doing a 45 minute presentation that starts with Claire, followed by Anne, and then Q&A. But we do ask that you share questions in real time, which will be moderated by myself, and then share directly with our panelists uh, at the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to get started um, welcoming Dr. Claire Wardle. Hi, everybody. Um, as ever, these are very strange times. <laughs> this is the second webinar of this week where I'm talking to lots of faceless people at a computer screen in my, from my studio apartment. So uh, as ever, I hope all of you are well. I hope your families are well. Um, and I know that we're all in the same boat. And I think because of that, everybody is trying to do the best they possibly can do. So um, actually, the Knight Foundation contacted me and said, would you like to do a webinar for uh, US newsrooms? And I, we jumped on it and we connected with the Asian American Journalist Association. And I think the materials we've put together, hopefully are actually practical and you'll come away with real um, useful practical tips. So we've called this reporting challenges. And one thing I want to say is there's an incredible number of amazing resources right now that have been pulled together by different groups. We have created a portal at First Draft, which you can get at firstdraftnews.org forward slash coronavirus. We will uh, send out all the links after the webinar, but there are a number of other places that are also doing incredible work. And we're going to include links to that as well. Um, but on this webinar, I wanted to talk about firstly, how to keep on top of misinformation trends around COVID-19, then quickly best practices for slowing down misinformation, and then end with best practices for reporting when it comes to headlines, images, and filling data voids, which I actually think is, I cannot stress enough how important this is right now. My team are monitoring for misinformation and we're actually seeing not very much misinformation necessarily. We're seeing a lot of exaggerated gossip where people are essentially saying, I'm hearing this, are you hearing this as well? And we're seeing lots of questions about symptoms and treatments. People need almost real time hourly updates about all of this. So that's what we're going to stress today. And in terms of keeping on top of misinformation trends, we're talking about this actually as online chatter, not misinformation. Um, there is disinformation, which is false information being shared to cause harm. Most of this is conspiracies about how the virus spread. Was it in a lab in China? Was it a lab in the US? Was it Bill Gates? But actually, that's kind of in the conspiracy spaces that you would um, normally expect. It's not something we should necessarily worry too much about. The thing we should worry about is two, three, and four. So firstly, misinformation on how the virus spreads. People don't know whether it will spread through their mail, how long the dro a droplet will stay on a metal surface. Uh, lots of misinformation about that. There's also mis and disinformation about symptoms and treatments. You know, lots of information about elderberries or if I take malaria tablets. We even saw today people talking about Ebola treatments. We're seeing people confusing cures and treatments. We're seeing very obscure medical experiments happening right now that are now being blown up on Facebook. It's, it's OK. Somebody's found a cure. So we need to keep on top of that. And finally, the most misinformation we're seeing right now is confusion about government and official responses. So I think all of us have seen WhatsApp messages, text messages saying there's going to be a lockdown. Um, it's happening across every state. It's actually happening across every country in the world right now. So in terms of keeping on top of this crowd tangle, which I hope most of you have got access to, but they have actually created live dashboards. So you don't have to do very much hard work. So here again, we'll send out the links, but it allows you to monitor Instagram, Facebook and Reddit. Uh, and they've created these hubs for you. They've even created specific hubs per state. So you can go and find these live dashboards for your state. So they're really, really useful. And I think the best starting point just to keep on top of the chatter that's happening uh, in your particular regions. I would also really recommend Twitter lists right now. There are very smart people who have created lists of verified users. Many of them are doctors, uh, then you know, people from the WHO or CDC, um, their healthcare authorities. 
th th these lists are excellent. So for example, I follow one by Gavin Sheridan. It's got 296 members on it. I look at it every morning and it really is verified sources giving me information that I can use. If you're trying to find local uh, Twitter lists, you might want to use a, a kind of a search string like this, COVID or coronavirus or COVID-19, and then site colon twitter.com forward slash asterisk forward slash lists. Again, we'll send all this stuff out, but this is a way to find different type of lists. And you could add to that California or Illinois or see if anybody's already created a Twitter list that you can just subscribe to. You don't then have to start from scratch. So just quickly, best practices for slowing down misinformation. This is based on a lot of psychological literature that I'm not going to go into, but here are five best practices to keep in mind. Number one, where possible, focus on the facts. Avoid repeating a falsehood unnecessarily while correcting it. Where possible, warn readers before repeating falsehoods. But one thing I'd say is if you're creating content that people might be searching for on Google and YouTube, then you might want to include the rumor in the headline because people are actively searching for this information and you're filling a data void. But if you're putting this out on Twitter or Facebook and Instagram and people can just stumble across it, please don't um, repeat the falsehood in your headline or your tweet. Our brains are really bad at disentangling this. So if you say it's not true about ibuprofen, people are like, what was it about ibuprofen and COVID? So where possible, always try and lead with the facts if you can. Secondly, make your content easy to process by keeping it simple, short, and easy to read. Use graphics to illustrate your points. Again, I know not every newsroom has a great designer, but we need to use uh, less, fewer words if we can. Where possible, try and find examples of really good illustrations that other people are using. I just saw an incredible video on, I think it was Instagram, which showed somebody washing their hands with black dye. And you could see that only by doing, washing your hands in a certain way did all the black dye cover the hands. And it was the most effective piece of content I'd seen about washing your hands. Third, please try and avoid ridicule or derogatory comments. Frame debunks in ways that are less threatening to a person's worldview. So I think you know this, but if somebody that you know and love is sharing false information in WhatsApp or on Facebook, don't send them a link to say that's wrong and here's Snopes telling you why you're wrong because that actually makes people turn away. Instead say, wow, I mean, I'm seeing these same messages as well, but I'm really wondering like who's forwarding them because it's causing more panic in our community. And actually I haven't seen, you know, I haven't seen our local health authority talk about this. Like I think we should all be more careful. We need to use language like we and us and community don't basically tell people they're wrong or they're stupid or they're crazy. Right now, we actually need to be talking in terms of a community and that comes from the psychological literature. For answer any quick questions that a debunk might arise, just say, simply saying that's wrong. What happens in somebody's brain is it kind of opens up a hole in their brain. She's like, oh, you're telling me it's false. If you don't explain to me why it's false, well, actually people are sharing information about elderberry supplements right now because they're trying to make money. I'm more likely to go, oh, okay, I understand why those falsehoods are circulating in the first place. So answer any questions about why people are doing it right now. Even to say people are sharing these WhatsApp messages because they're scared and people are looking for answers. You know, we really should be going to our local health website or to our government website. And finally, be precise with language. Be aware how certain language can drive down trust more generally. So again, we're going to talk a little bit about headlines, but be really careful about kind of language that's scaremongering. Uh, language that could be perceived to be um, problematic or um, I mean for example yesterday lots of young people on Instagram and Facebook were very upset about this emerging news that says that young people are also at risk of COVID and they said we've been lied to by the news organizations that told us that it wasn't going to affect us so again just think about how we're framing this we need so many caveats right now because information is changing all the time so I know that you wouldn't do this, but I just want to remind people, please don't say anything like 10 myths about the coronavirus and just list the myths. Our brains are, just can't handle that. We're more likely to remember the myths than we are the facts. So wherever possible, only lead with the facts if you can. And finally, best practices for reporting on COVID-19. One, think about the headlines. Here's some examples um, that one of my colleagues pulled together. I mean, you can see this US coronavirus case is nearly double with no end in sight catastrophe. I know everybody's terrified right now, but we actually need to do whatever we can to dial down the panic because the panic's actually going to lead to more problems. So for example, saying practical tips for coronavirus prevention, 10 lessons from Asia on how to live with coronavirus. There's so many lessons from places like South Korea and Singapore 
um, that we should be drawing upon. And I, I don't necessarily think that we are we are reporting enough about what lessons have been learned elsewhere. Um, and for example, a silly example, but Twitter moments every morning, they lead with how many people have died, but after the comma, they tell me how many people have survived. And by telling you that, it just helps our brains understand and make sense of the risk. Because unfortunately, humans are really bad at making sense of risk. So you can have a whole pile of scientific evidence, but if you see a personal experience of this happened to me, people are more drawn to that personal experience. So balancing the, yes, these are the dangers, these are how many people have died, but how many people have survived? Tell me that at the same time can make a big difference. And also I talked about, don't talk about derogatory language, um, talking about people's behavior being bizarre, you know, insanity, all of this, we need to be much more careful about the language that we're using. Um, and I think Anne is going to talk a little bit more about images, but here's some examples right now. We're seeing, as we know, lots of images of Asian people wearing masks. Uh, we're seeing lots of empty shelves. Psychological literature shows, tells us, if we see these kind of images, we're more likely to partake in this behavior. So, for example, 20 years ago, the Annenberg School did a study on um, anti-marijuana smoking ads. And all the ads showed young people in garages smoking marijuana. When they did the evaluation, it showed that those ads actually drove more people to smoke marijuana because the garages looked really fun. So we have to be really aware of the messages we're sending. And actually showing what's happening means that people, more people are going to actually model that behavior or be more scared. And please, fewer hazmat suits. Um, we're also seeing stock imagery of like people with ambulances and gurneys. Uh, wherever we can, we have to think about our imagery. And, uh, you know, this is from Italy, but around vaccines, Self Magazine actually um, asked uh, a photographer to create stock photography with more diverse imagery and happy babies getting vaccinated because most of our stock images around vaccines were about babies crying. And I keep thinking about this as an example with COVID, like what's the equivalent? How can we create stock imagery that actually is gonna dial down the panic in a world where lots of people are only looking at the headlines and looking at the images? And finally, please think about filling data voids with service journalism. So if you go to Google Trends right now, they have coronavirus specific dashboards and it allows you to see what people are searching for. And you will realize that almost on an hourly basis, people are asking different questions because they're confused. And you can drill down to say, I just wanna see what people are searching for in Illinois. I just wanna see what people are searching for in Santa Fe. And it will help you think about what kind of um, stories you can tell right now that can fill the data voids that we have. So data voids are when people search and they can't find quality content and all they can find is conspiracy content or false or misinformation. So again, there's a real moment right now to kind of create this evergreen content um, around these questions that people are asking. So I, I'm not sure if you can see, but the top it says, can I catch coronavirus from opening the mail? And here, the Washington Post actually used an image from the WHO. They've created these little blue pins. They worked with Pinterest. Uh, and by doing that, they got into the top carousel. So, you know, if you're a local newsroom, I've seen examples here of local Detroit newsrooms being in the top carousel on national stories. If you are basically using good SEO and you're answering questions that people have, you will find yourself at the top of Google and in that carousel. So I know many local newsrooms are really struggling right now <clears throat> in terms of traffic, this can make a big difference. So this is a tip sheet that we'll send out um, at the end of the webinar, but these are kind of checklists and tips about thinking about reporting responsibly on COVID-19. And I think again, many of you know this, but having this printing out, putting it next to your computer, I think right now we need as much help as we can get to ensure that our reporting is working. And we're having these conversations every single day internally at First Draft, which is what images should we use? Is that headline appropriate? Have we tweeted something that's irresponsible? So um, this is the end of my part. Um, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them. Again, we'll send out links to everything I just talked about. But I'd now like to pass over to Anne Doe, who's going to talk a little bit about the challenges of being on the ground and reporting right now on COVID-19. Hi, everyone. We thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate what Claire shared with us. I think in the hardest of moments, people look for two things. One, our solutions and two is a sense of fellowship, even in isolation. Um, you know, as we are planning our reporting day to day, we focus on these two ideals a lot of the times. What are people wanting to know the most? 
We're searching for answers on Twitter, on um, anecdotes brought back from reporters out in the field and from reporters' own circles. This is what they're getting on their own social media platforms. And because we're all mostly working from home, we're trying to figure out a way to stay in closer touch with each other as well as our editors. I know a lot of people have DM me separately about, you know, I'm working on this story, how should I start? I see so many familiar themes, I'm looking for something unusual. Let me encourage you to think off the beaten path. For example, uh, one of the best stories I've seen all week long are um, an example from my own colleagues, Javed Kalim and Haley Branson Potts. Javed is a national reporter and Haley is a metro reporter. So they're looking at all the people going about in their daily lives and the jobs they're holding, and they're asked, you know, closing down businesses every day is really tough. But what do you do when it's your job to bury the dead? Uh, these two reporters went out and talked to funeral directors all across the nation to get a glimpse of their day-to-day -day life. Another example that I saw on KTLA, a local Los Angeles television station is, you know, people are trapped in their home and they have nothing to do. They are depressed. So one person said, let's string up Christmas lights. Let's do something to share the beauty within our own homes and spread that out into the world. What if there's a first responder driving by our neighborhood? Maybe these lights will make them happier. So that started a trend and people posted this on Twitter. They got hundreds and later thousands of messages from sharing. And this became a story. Another story that I saw um, advertised by adweek.com is can food bloggers save Chinatown? We, we've been seeing all the images shared of, you know, Chinatown stay away. This is what um, part of the origin of the virus, wrongly so. And so these food bloggers who are influencers in their own right are turning their attention to a unique community that really needs enlightenment at this time and needs a sense of marketing to really dial down what is going on there and uh, why are people avoiding it? They should not be avoiding it. Let's uh, show each other how much we support Chinatown. Another thing that I want to encourage you when you're looking for story ideas out there is let's not make it difficult. Focus on practicality. While language needs to be more precise, as Claire emphasized, have you just thought of taking a walk in your neighborhood where people are quarantined and bringing to life what you witnessed? Ordinary stories, ordinary people need and can be highlighted in extraordinary times. This is what we want to read about. It's not just the public officials calling the daily press conferences. We want to know how it's affecting people in their daily lives. I read a pointer newsletter where it says, uh, quoting Lester Holt, from NBC Nightly News. What we're doing is to be as people-centric as we can. How are people being affected? Answer this question in your daily reporting. You know, crisis can be overwhelming and we have daily deadlines during crisis that are extra overwhelming, but when possible, you can narrow your focus to writing about a specific city, a specific street, or a specific family. And these little things or little themes add up to illuminate a bigger picture. When you're reporting, please remember, as we're all trying, myself included, to infuse diverse sources. For example, and this is a theme that we really focus on within AAJA, when looking for academic or medical experts, 
search an institution's website for their staff list. Go through the names, the photos, the faces, the backgrounds. You may find options rather than just accept a referral to someone who is often quoted from the communications manager. And this off-quoted person may be articulate and may be wonderful. You know, nothing to um, downplay the person's expertise. But I just think, you know, like with the food that we eat, variety is the spice of life and the spice of content. When you're diverse, um, focusing on diversity sourcing, please, it's not just about ethnicity or culture. Once again, we're reminded to connect to people of different ages, professions, economic or religious background, sexual orientation, and think geography. You know, for us here in Los Angeles, it's not just the West Side or downtown LA. We need to go into the San Gabriel Valley, Boyle Heights, the San Fernando Valley, uh, further down in Orange County, Riverside County, things like that. You know, if you ever need to brainstorm who to talk to, reach out to some of us and we'll be glad to help you. And a final reminder before we take your questions is to seek joy amid the trauma that we're covering. These type of stories have a huge readership or viewership because people don't always want to read bad news, as you know. Thank you so much for following along with us. Excellent, Thanks. thank you. Um, so I'll kick off a couple of questions and just a reminder to either submit your questions in the Q&A or chat function, which will be at the bottom of your screen to the right-hand side of participants. Uh, I'll start off with a question from Vanessa. She says, what do you make of the president's press conferences? There is so much conflicting information, it's hard to report on the briefings and make sense of what the president is communicating to the press. Claire, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I mean, I think um, journalists have had to respond over the last three years to the challenge of almost real-time fact-checking. We have had in the last two weeks some real challenges around the things that um, President Trump is specifically saying. So, for example, this time last week was a press conference when he said the White House was working with Google and Google immediately had to say, not really. Um, so I, I would actually say right now, things like taking a feed live or live tweeting what the president is saying is actually pretty dangerous because there is evidence that what's coming out in real time is not true. I actually think that there needs to be some kind of delay um, just because it, unless people, as we know, the many few, fewer people see the actual correction than the original output. So um, on things that are as, as critical, um, I think there needs to be a delay so that there can be some fact checking to help audiences. I don't know if Anne agrees. Claire, those are good points. I would also say, if possible, in your newsroom, have someone or a team assigned to fact checking and uh, fact checking on certain topic areas so that they already claim the expertise in that topic area. It will speed up the work. I think that's a great point, Anne, actually, that we have realized that a lot of people had their political correspondence covering the White House. And on this, you also obviously need your health and science correspondence right there. Um, to be able to do that kind of real-time fact-checking. And your healthcare reporters, or like say, if he targets a certain specific area, the Bay Area, you know, have reporters assigned who are familiar with that region of their coverage. Great, excellent. Um, our next question comes from Kelsey. Uh, she says what she's personally seen on Facebook and Twitter is that my friends don't want to believe the info that's right in front of them. They say a number of the cases and deaths are exaggerated and the media is lying. I've seen one post on Facebook that goes as far to say that the media is the enemy of the people. How can I gracefully lead them to the truth and restore their faith? So this is such a great question because unfortunately, three years of attacks on the press have led us to this point right now, which means when uh, we really need people to be trusting in their news organizations, not everybody is. I mean, th that is why I think kind of peer-to-peer -peer networks are unfortunately now becoming more popular because people are turning inwards. But I do think particularly around Corona, 
Unfortunately, we do have data and experiences from other countries that I think very gently showing um, what has happened elsewhere and to say, you know, look at this graph that shows, you know, we're 10 days behind Italy and look where Italy is now. Uh, there was a really powerful podcast a couple of days ago that the New York Times Daily ran with an Italian doctor. I think we have to, we have to essentially very gently use data and evidence, but three, through storytelling. Um, so yes, show the graph, but also, you know, um, share the audio of a doctor crying saying, these are the decisions I've had to make. I mean, there's, you know, we can't say that um, America isn't on the same trajectory as Italy. So even though it's hard for people to hear, I think we need to, we need to do more of that. And apart from the national and international trend that um, Claire is focusing on, like getting a whole of the big picture, I also think it would be helpful, Kelsey, if you can narrow down the information for your friend. What city does he or she live in? What region? And get the numbers, the data to reflect what's going on in that area. Go to the hometown newspaper in that area or the hometown television station and see what they're focusing on, on their own people in that area. And maybe that will hit closer to home for him or her. Great, and uh, Madeline also in a similar vein asked, um, so many of these rumors are stemming from the fact that people simply do not trust the government's messages. How can we respect that fact while combating misinformation, i.e. pointing out people to official channels for information? So I think to go back to Anne's point, there is actually a difference right now between federal governments and state and local officials. And I think because this is very much a, a kind of a state by state basis, I think there, there is recognition of like, well, can we, can we share information from our hospitals, um, from, you know, from our uh, e experts? Because I think, you know, as we know, there have been some concerns about whether or not the federal government was taking this seriously enough and quickly enough. And I think right now we need to, we need to be thinking as local as possible. Again, narrow it down. Claire mentioned the hospitals. And yes, you know, we all belong to some kind of group or community unless you're a hermit. You can think like, what is your parents group? If you're a parent in your neighborhood, what are they saying? Maybe this friend would trust those kind of sources more than government sources. What is their own uh, doctor's group saying? What are they posting online in their uh, healthcare website? It's sources like that. And then you kind of just have to balance and make a judgment call. Thank you. And um, we have a follow-up question to how can we build trust with communities who don't feel the news is accessible for them, particularly if English isn't their first language? It's been really difficult to convince family members that the army isn't coming to London when there are pictures going around. I think this is one of those moments when you can partner with a community media, so-called ethnic media, and uh, go to a, a reliable outlet specializing in that language and work to translate materials and have translated materials double-checked and fact-checked by a reliable uh, separate individual translator. There's lots of ways you can do things like that. I know that in the Los Angeles area, we have you know, hundreds of languages represented among our households. So this is that um, perfect sort of uh, storm where you can really get to know your neighbors, your media neighbors, and get more information spread out there. And I think also, as I, as I said, um, around people turning to one another. These messages that say there's going to be a lockdown in 72 hours. I mean, I actually admitted this on a webinar yesterday, but on Sunday night, I was in a group of people that I really, really trust. And somebody shared one of those lockdown messages. And right now I'm living alone and I'm scared. And I actually forwarded it to Nell. And on Monday morning, I had to wake up and say, I'm so sorry, I made a mistake. But right now we should be saying to everybody, all of us are being impacted right now. We are human. It doesn't matter whether we're a nurse or a journalist or with anybody, all of us are scared. And so I think having conversations with each other to say, right now we have to help one another through this. So in many ways, it's about how do we make sure that our WhatsApp groups are not full of polluted information? Well, we have to take responsibility to each other. So the example of the tanks on the street, 
We have examples of those images in France, Ireland, the US, Australia. So I think it's useful to say to people, listen, everybody on the planet right now is scared. And look, we're all seeing the same rumors. And that's because we're human. And this is the most frightening thing that's happened in a generation. And so I think, you know, I've been doing webinars for years about, you know, media literacy. I need to have to say now, it doesn't matter how many times you're trained in this stuff. Right now, um, we're all emotional. So I think talking to one another to say, if you see a piece of information and it gives you an emotional reaction, does it make you want to cry? Does it make you want to shout? Does it make you want to go and buy something that makes you feel in control? Well, all of those triggers should make you think, hang on, take a deep breath, because actually if we all are sharing this, that's going to lead to panic. And my fear right now is, you know, we are, Governor Cuomo just said, we are in New York are 45 days away from the peak. What happens when people start sharing rumors to say that there's no bank notes in the banks that you know, you mustn't go to this hospital because there are no supplies, go to another hospital. I mean, I'm really worried about what this might lead to. So I do think we have a responsibility to say to those people that we love and care about in these family groups, um, slow down, please don't share this. I know we're scared, but we're all scared. And I think that message of, is important for everybody to be um, sharing with each other right now. And as a small PS to what I said earlier about partnering with community members or community media, why not host a Facebook Live event to answer questions from your combined audiences? That's one uh, simple thing that we can do, even while, you know, stuck in our homes. That's a great idea, Ryan. Next question, how can we verify if an image we receive via WhatsApp is disinformation or real? Today I received an image a sort of flyer made by the Mexican government saying that the coronavirus is not an emergency. I did Google reverse search to find out if it was real or not. Are there other ways to verify if something is true or disinformation? This is such a great question. Um, so we are definitely seeing kind of images of tanks moving on interstates. We're seeing these kind of pamphlets and posters and flyers circulating on WhatsApp. You did exactly what you should do, which is to do a reverse image search. But I've been saying to people right now, things are moving so quickly. Hello, can you hear me? And we just lost Claire. Do you um, have anything you want to take on that topic or I will ask? Yes, yes. I, I actually think one simple thing that you might be able to do is contact your local um, Mexican consulate and share the image with the representative and track it down that way. Great, thank you. Claire, do we have you back? Yes, I'm back. Excellent. Um, did you want to add anything else and followed up with what you were saying? No, that's fine. Okay, great. So um, can you talk about how to frame the civic sector's response? Lots of people are talking about recovery already and fear it will go to big banks rather than nonprofits, who thanks to increased demands are stretched to the point of breaking. How can we make those stories about post-crisis recovery, economic reorganizing, et cetera, as critical and interesting as the ones about how to wash your hands? I think one of the um, clear answers is to humanize your stories. Tell it through people's personal experiences and how that's impacting their lives. And when you're looking to do that, try to remember to highlight the quieter people in your communities not just the obvious public officials, but those who are existing or struggling on the fringes. You know, those folks who rarely come into contact with the press. And when you're looking to tell stories about concepts or business or things that seem process related, things that seem more difficult to grasp, think personal and think also multi-generational when interviewing, like your key source may lead you to another valuable voices in the same household. Great, thank you, Anne. Uh, one additional question, how should philanthropic support for journalism and media change right now? It's a great question. I would say that there are lots of people who are 
responding very quickly and in many ways just like having to dive into core funds and many nonprofits don't have core funds at all so I think if there's any way to speed up the grant making process um, of course everybody's going to say that but I think um, right now I am seeing a few philanthropic organizations saying you know we, we you know we're offering a million dollars here um, etc cetera, etc cetera. I also think um, there are good people working, thinking collaboratively for maybe more money, because my fear is there's going to be lots of very small grants, which right now doesn't do what it needs to do. So I think, um, and I know the Ford Foundation has opened up grants to say, if you had project funding, we will switch that to core funding, which makes a massive difference for organizations that right now have to do very quick hires. I mean, the sadness to me is I'm seeing all of these people laid off and I'm trying to find how is there a way that we could very quickly take some of these very uh, like these incredible people and find a way to use them. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I think we need to get creative and we need to do it in the next couple of weeks. Yes, getting creative is key because this is the time to crowdsource, fund source your uh, projects and get them out there ASAP because the story is so fluid, it's changing by the hour. Great, and we have a question specifically for you from Michelle. She says, you are such a great street reporter. What strategies are you using to move your great reporting online? How are you connecting with people in the Vietnamese community in OC? For example, you may have phones, but no, for people who may have phones, but not Zoom, et cetera. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. So getting sources to talk in person has already been a challenge, right? And one technique that I've been using is um, asking them what would make you feel comfortable to talk to me. I need to write this piece really quickly because so much is happening, but I would appreciate just having a chance to ask you three questions. That's it, three. That's it, I'll be gone. Then if they wanna keep talking, then more power to both of us. Getting sources to talk by phone can even be more challenging, especially in this environment where so many of us as journalists are stuck working at home or be isolated from our public. So one way is to plan your approach with common sense. For example, if you're online with them and they have children who may interrupt a conversation when they need something from their parents, be flexible. Just say, hey, all hold on. How old is your child? How is she or he handling this? They don't need to have online access. A phone will do it all. Stay flexible to the hours. You know, people are staying up beyond midnight to catch up with the news in Asia, for example. If they want me to interview them at 1 a.m., I'm open to that. Great, thank you, Anne. Um, and Michelle, I did have a follow-up question. How are you finding new sources without going out? I'm cold calling or uh, cold connecting to people on social platforms. I just private DM them, or if I don't get a response, I post directly on their Facebook pages. Excellent. Uh, well, we're nearing the end. While uh, any more questions come in, Claire, and anything you'd like to say in closing to all of our attendees here today? Yeah, that was such a great question about um, people who are, who obviously are out, you know, who who rely so heavily on mobile. I think those of us who are like now working at home, we've kind of like got our laptops, and that's what we're thinking. Like, I would love the New York City government to send me almost hourly push notifications on my phone. So, thinking about ways that you can. Think about short, snappy notifications right now for people who, as I said, the absence of quality information is making people look to other places. So they're on their phones with everybody else. Is there a way that we can get more of our quality information and content onto people's phones? I think is critical. I also want to remind our uh, participants to consider signing up for a newsletter to stay in touch with the news and trends. And a lot, of, a lot of the largest newspapers have these daily newsletters, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and here at the LA Times, we have coronavirus today. A pointer also has an excellent newsletter called Covering COVID-19. So just go directly to their website. And I wanted to say thanks, everyone, for your valuable time today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anne. And also on that point, if I, I know a few of you said, um, if I see WhatsApp messages, you know, at First Draft, we are right now, we have a team of 10 monitoring this, 
helping newsrooms if they're seeing things that are problematic. So in our links that we'll send out in about an hour, we'll make sure that we have an address for you to send that to us so that we can help you in any way verify rumors that you're seeing because it's in our interest to say we're seeing the same rumors in Indiana and Phoenix and Seattle. Um, so yeah, if there's anything we can do to help in the verification space, we would love to do that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to both of our panelists. In closing, I will repeat what Claire shared, which is within the next hour, you will receive a follow-up email from the team with a series of links. If you are feeling interested right now in the moment to continue your research, if you go to firstdraftnews.org, right on our homepage, you'll see a big red button that says find out more that'll lead you to our COVID-19 resources that you can experience immediately. Otherwise, in the email will be a recording of today's call. If you have it, I uh, would like to share with anyone else in your newsroom. Thank you again for your time and being here with us today. If there aren't any more questions, we will go ahead and uh, say goodbye. Thanks very much, Nell. Oh, Nell. Yes, I, I wanted to ask people, um, we also have resources listed on our Asian American Journalist Association website at AAJA.org, uh, a guideline on how to cover, you know, diverse communities in time of virus. Excellent. And I will, a uh, final closing note, we have tracked all of the questions that can, have come in today. There were a couple of repeats, but um, if your question wasn't specifically addressed to you, I'll be sure to get you an answer. I have everyone's email addresses that registered between uh, when the, the webinar went live until this morning. Um, so again, everything has been tracked. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.